Stacy Salisbury realized that she didn't have the relationship with God that she knew she should. So she asked him to give it to her. I prayed and I asked him to fill me with that longing for him. And what a prayer to pray, right? He is faithful to do that. And he did. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm Dana Gresh. You know, I think we can all agree that there's one spiritual discipline that Christians struggle with more than any other, and that is prayer. Why is it that something that sounds so simple is so hard? I mean, you can't read your Bible until you know how to read, but even a three-year-old can pray. But now, as a grandma, Nana Dana, they call me, I still feel like I'm learning new ways to pray, and sometimes I still need staying power. Have you been there? Well, for a child of God, prayer isn't optional. There are many well-known Bible verses that command us to pray, and there are even more that show prayer as a way of life. One that's probably less familiar to you is Psalm 55, verse 16. It says, I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Prayer is necessary to the Christian life. God is omnipotent. He doesn't need our prayers in order to work, but often he chooses not to work in certain areas until people recognize their need for him and call out for help. Today, we're going to hear from some wonderful praying women. And if you're thinking, oh, I hope they tell me how to pray for my husband. He really needs to be changed. Just hang on. (laughs) Did you know that before you can pray for God to work in other people's lives, he needs to work in your life. Until you find all you need in Christ, hoping that your family will change isn't going to help you. If you realize that you need to change, the best thing you can do is simply talk to God about it. Stacy Salisbury learned this over a period of many years. She sat down with me and Nancy Damas Walgamuth to talk about it, and she said she had everything she wanted since she was little, a college degree, a husband, and several children. Yet, she wasn't completely satisfied. I felt depleted as a mom. It was not fulfilling me as I thought it would. And, you know, I was the little girl looking for the stay-at-home mom table on career day. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I had always wanted. And then when I had it in my grasp, I thought, well, what's wrong with me? Why does this not satisfy me like I thought that it would? And it's because it's not intended to satisfy me like a relationship with Christ is. So— When did you start to realize that? When did you start to realize, I am never, I have to say, what I hear is something I see in my own life sometimes and hear from other women is you're never really living in the here and now for Jesus because you're so consumed with what you need in the future and what you're asking Him for in the future. So when did you start to really say, this cycle isn't working, I need to change Mm -hmm. it? What did that look like? Take us kind of to that room, that day, that time Mm -hmm. period when you really understood, Mm -hmm. I have to stop this pattern. Mm, You know, I had kind of had enough. I was tired of being discontent. Mm. I had so many wonderful things, so many blessings that God had given me, and yet I still wanted more. Even with kids, you know, it became, well, now I need my alone time. Well, now I need date nights. Well, now I need a vacation. Oh, wait, now we need a bigger house. Yeah. And I didn't like what was coming out of me. I knew the discontentment wasn't right. And by the grace of God, He woke me up. And He did that through Scripture. I was reading in my Bible one day, and I will never forget this moment. I was studying the book of Genesis, so I had been in the Word. Mm -hmm. I had been reading, but I would say it was just a part of my life. It wasn't where I was seeking for satisfaction, but I opened up my Bible. I had been studying in Genesis 15, and in Genesis 15, 1, God says to Abraham, Abraham, I am your very great reward. And I thought, wow, is God my reward? Wow. He had been maybe a part of the blessing in my life, but He was not my reward. And it struck me how much I wanted God to be my reward. Wow. The picture I'm getting in my head is, I don't know, Stacy, sweet, 
middle school, high school, college, young mom Stacy really loves Jesus, but she's waiting for the next award or reward he's going to give her, right, for yes. following him. Yes. And suddenly now you're realizing, I don't want something in his hands. I want it to just be him, his presence that is yes. the reward. Yes, yes. And it was a switch in thought for me. Hmm. It wasn't the blessings of God that I was seeking. Well, it was, but it didn't need to be. It needed to be Him. He needed to be the one thing above all else that I was seeking. And practically, what changed at that moment? What did you do differently? Was it were you just thinking differently? How how did that change the trajectory for you? You know, first I confessed my sin. I realized that I had been chasing all of these other things, and not that they were bad things, Mm -hmm. but just spending years of begging God for this or that. But what if we beg God for Him? And so I started doing that. Lord, I don't know how to do this well, but give me more of You. That's what I need in my life. That's I see. I want you to be my reward. And so I prayed and I asked him to fill me with that longing for him. And what a prayer to pray, right? He is faithful to do that. And he did. Did it change overnight? You read that Bible verse, you prayed that prayer, and suddenly your mind was in alignment with that truth, or did you still find yourself slipping into the desire for things or other rewards? Definitely still found myself slipping back into it. You know, my eyes had been awakened to the truth, but it is still a constant fight for God to be my reward and not this or that, or success in this area, you know, that's something that I could chase now, or even for certain successes with my children. Yeah. And so it's a constant fight and reminder. I have to be in God's Word daily if I'm going to be able to fight against that. But there was also a joy Hmm. that had been missing. That was a gift You know, I don't think that contentment is something that we can conjure up. I can't tell myself, okay, Stacy, now you need to be content with this. You can do this. You can do this. Contentment was really a gift I found God gave me as I spent time with Him. It was a blessing that I received from Him. Don't you love it when God answers your prayers in a really obvious way? That's what happened for Stacey Salisbury. Maybe you've never tried it, but you can be sure that if you humbly ask God to be made more like Him, to have greater longing for Him, He will give it to you. Now, as Stacey said, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifelong battle. I can testify to that. But God will remain faithful to His promise. Now, you may be wondering, isn't it selfish to pray for myself? I asked Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth that very question, and here's what she said. I can feel selfish that I'm praying things for myself, and yet there are qualities that we know God wants us to have, things we know He wants to do in our lives that we need to pray for, because we don't have those things. We need Him to give them to us. We sure do. Well, Nancy talked about some of the things that she prays for herself. She calls them personal petitions. An important one is to pray, Lord, guard my heart. If you aren't sure what to ask God for, that's a good request to start with. Here's Nancy with more details. The thing is, as long as we're in this fallen world, our hearts are still vulnerable to being influenced by the world, the world around us, the world system, by our flesh, indwelling sin. It's not been removed and it won't be fully removed until we see Jesus and we're like him. And then we have the devil who works with his minions to get us to live the old way and not to live as new creatures with a new heart. Now, if our heart has toxins in it, if it's not inclined toward the Lord and toward his ways, what comes out of our hearts will reflect that. Apart from Christ giving us a new heart, we're bent to sin. Out of the, the, within, from the heart of man, come these things. Now, if our heart is pure and it's filled with Christ and his word and his ways, What comes out in our behavior, in our speech, in our actions, in our attitudes, all of this will reflect 
the purity of heart. Now, because the heart is so important, that's why it's so important for our redeemed hearts to be protected, to be guarded, to be kept for God. And you and I will never get to the point where we don't need God's power to keep and guard and protect our hearts. If he let my heart go for one day, I'm gonna be back acting like a pagan, at least from the inside. God knows the heart, right? We need him, we need his keeping power. And so when I pray, Lord, guard my heart, I'm praying, Lord, give me a whole heart, an undivided heart, a heart that is totally devoted to you, not half a heart, not a divided heart. I'm praying what the psalmist prayed in Psalm 86, verse 11, unite my heart to fear your name. That's part of what I'm praying. I'm praying, Lord, keep me from things that would distract my heart, that would take my focus away from you. Keep me from trivial pursuits, things that are not worthy of you. So I'm praying, Lord, Lord, give me a whole heart. I'm also praying, Lord, guard my affections, what I love, what I value. I want to love you with my whole heart. I wanna love what you love. So keep me from things that would steal my affections. Keep me from idols. Keep me from lesser loves. Keep me from loving anything or anyone more than I love you. When I pray, Lord, guard my heart, that's what I'm praying. Guard my affections. I'm also praying, Lord, would you guard my mind? Would you guard my thoughts? Would you keep me from deception, from believing things that aren't true about you or about myself or about others? Would you help me to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you guard my mind? And then I'm praying, would you protect me from the evil one? Jesus prayed this for his disciples and for us in John 17, verse 15, he said, oh God, keep them from the evil one. That's part of what we're praying when we pray, Lord, guard my heart. If Jesus prayed that for us, do you not think we should pray that for ourselves? Keep us from the evil one. Keep us from his subtle schemes, the wiles of the devil. Keep us from his overt attacks. Protect us, keep us, keep us from temptation. Keep us from sin. When I pray, God, guard my heart, I'm praying, Lord, keep me from sinning. I don't wanna sin, but I'm prone at times to sin. So guard my heart. Psalm 19 talks about two kinds of sins that the psalmist wanted to be protected from. He prayed for protection from hidden faults, those things that maybe we can't even see in our own hearts. And he prayed to be kept from presumptuous sins, from willful sin. Lord, keep me from every kind of sin. Keep me from worry, from anxiety, from fear, from pride, from selfishness. Put your sin in that list. I'm praying, Lord, keep my heart from loving this world system that is anti-God. Help me to love you, guard my heart. I'm praying, Lord, keep my heart tender and pliable and responsive. Keep me tender and responsive to the Holy Spirit. Give me a touch sensitive conscience. So when I grieve your Holy Spirit, I know it and I deal with it right away. Guard my heart. Now, Psalm 121 tells us that the Lord is our keeper. He's our keeper. He guards our hearts. Philippians chapter four talks about the peace of God that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If instead of worrying about everything, you pray about everything, then the peace of God will guard. It will be like a fortress around your heart. So if you want that heart to be guarded, then stop being anxious, stop worrying and start praying about everything. And it says, then the peace of God will put a fortress, a guard around your heart. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, there are two interesting verses here. 2 Timothy 1, first of all, in verse 12, he says, I know whom I've believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So who guards our hearts? Who did Paul say he was convinced would guard his heart? God would. But then look at verse 14 of 2 Timothy 1. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So who's supposed to guard our hearts? We are by the power of the Holy Spirit. So who's supposed to guard our hearts, God or us? Yes, we need him to guard our hearts and we have to make choices that help us guard our hearts. He guards, we must guard. We're responsible for, for choices that affect the condition of our hearts. 
You see this in the case of King Solomon as, long, as well as many other Old Testament kings. But here's an obvious one in 1 Kings chapter 11. Just listen to this. King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. So God said, don't marry these foreign women. They will turn your hearts away. What did Solomon do? The wisest man who ever lived did something really dumb. He married women, God said, not to marry. Solomon clung to these in love. In fact, he really got carried away. Verse three, he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. This hardly seems possible. And what happened? His wives turned away his heart. Exactly what God said would happen. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. And David's a man who sinned greatly at a season in his life, committed immorality, adultery, treason against a nation, but he was called a man after God's own heart because when confronted with his sin, he repented. God cannot bless the foolish things that we have done in our past, but I'll tell you what he can bless, and that is a broken and a repentant heart. So when we pray, Lord, guard my heart, help me to guard my heart. Help me not to make foolish choices that will put me in a place where my heart may get turned away from you. Wow. Did you know there were so many verses that talk about how God guards your heart? And that's not even all of them. That was Nancy DeMoss Wagamuth talking about just one of the ways that she asked God to work in her own heart. This year, I've been asking God to work in my heart by praying this over and over. Lord, every time I open your word, do something essential in my heart. Once you've humbled yourself and asked God to change you, by all means, pray for your family. You want them to experience God's work just like you have. In fact, one thing that is always a great idea is recruiting prayer warriors to pray with you. Did you know there's a team of folks here at Revive Our Hearts who will pray for your specific requests? So let us know how you'd like us to be praying for you. Online, just go to reviveourhearts.com slash prayer and get those warriors to do some battle on your behalf. Evelyn Christensen was a prayer warrior. She's been with the Lord now for several years, but she spoke from experience when Nancy discussed prayer with her, and she knows what it's like to pray many, many years for a family member to come to Christ. Here's Evelyn. We prayed 30 years for my brother. Isn't and, that yes. something? And he did come to know the Lord yes, as well? Yes, and that's a, a wonderful mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. He was my little little brother, and uh, we were playmates two years apart. You know how mm-hmm. it is with children. Sure. We were just we were just so close. And uh, he sort of seemed to come Jesus' way or whatever he did when he was about seven. I was nine, he was seven. And uh, we thought maybe, we really thought he had accepted Jesus, mm-hmm. but but evidently it wasn't the real thing, whatever. He, everybody else maybe was doing it. I'm not right. quite sure. And little by little, my father with his very worldly lifestyle, my brother, when he got old enough, started traveling. My father was a highway contractor, and that made him live away and come home weekends. And it was a horrible lifestyle into which to bring a young boy. And so my brother finally decided that there was no God with his godly mother. Hmm. And those mothers who are godly and are praying for their children, this is something you can't guarantee that they're just going to come right along with you because they don't. And but you not keep necessarily. praying. But you keep praying. You never stop. Mm-hmm. And, and my mother persevered. I think some of the other family members would, would we'd get real warm on it. And we'd pray like mad, and then we'd kind of forget a little bit. Not mother. She never did. And for those whole 30 years where my brother said there is no God, finally my mother prayed a prayer. That's a very hard one to pray. She had prayed everything possible. My brother had gone through three wives, three swimming pools, and everything mm-hmm. else, and just you know the lifestyle he was in. And she finally prayed, Lord, do anything you have to do to my son to bring him to Jesus. Very short time after that, he was in Detroit, Michigan. He was walking across a highway and a car traveling 50 miles an hour, hitting broadside. Mm. They peeled him mm. off the car, off the windshield, put him in intensive care, of course, and, and uh, 
pump and put all the pumps on him and they wouldn't let us see him. We all mm-hmm. flew in and gathered in a motel. And they said there's no point in seeing him. He's just a he's just you know dead. There's mm-hmm. no there's there's no mm-hmm. life there. It's only the pumps that are. And working. how long was this after she'd prayed that prayer? Oh, very shortly after that. It wasn't a long time at all. Mm-hmm. And I can see my little mother when we gathered in that hotel or in the hospital rather, when they wouldn't let us in to see him. She just dropped her head down on her knees and she shuddered Mm. and she said, is this my fault? Is this my fault? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder that when I pray this for my children. Lord, do anything you need to do to bring them back to Jesus. That's not an easy prayer. And then we all gathered as a family. We were a praying family. And in the motel, we all gathered in one room around that bed. And we wept and sobbed before God. Mm. We said, Lord... Give us one more time to talk to Bud. We had talked to him. We'd loved him. We'd done everything we knew how to do and prayed for him and everything. We had done everything. Mm -hmm. But we asked for one more More chance. chance. Next morning, they wouldn't let us go in to see him. We all gathered in the hospital. Then they decided to let two of us go in. Well, it would be mother, of course. Mm -hmm. And then they chose me. Mm -hmm. And I I got to go in Mm -hmm. with my mother. We had 10 minutes only. And we waited and I waited. I wanted to say something so badly. And finally, I kneeled, le- sort of leaned over Bud. And I said, Bud, God loves you. Mm. And his body stirred. Mm. And there was life there. Mm. And then I didn't dare say anything more. I thought, if I say too much, I'm going to push him right over into eternity, mm. the eternity I didn't want him to face. Right. And I waited till the 10 minutes were almost up. And then... I leaned over him and I said, Bud, can you trust Jesus today? Mm. And my brother instantaneously came alive and he smiled and he grinned through all those pumps going down his throat. And he said, "Uh, uh," and he lived. He died from cancer two years later, but he lived as a Christian for two years. Yes, and does. So don't give up if, yes. you're, if you're praying. Yes. I mean, people say, I prayed for a whole year. This one hasn't found Christ, or I, I'm giving up on my children. I'm slamming the door. They can go out and live their own life. Don't ever give up. So we know as a family what it means 25 years and 30 years. To persevere. Persevere. And then to pray that prayer. You said you've prayed that for your children, Lord, whatever it takes. Oh, that's a difficult one to pray. I've done that, yes. Lord, whatever it takes. When I think every mother, every parent knows that their children will do things that they don't approve. Mm-hmm. And then, Lord, do what it takes. Not just if they're doing something that you don't want, but Lord, do what it takes to make that child what you want that child to be, the finer gold. That's Evelyn Christensen talking about how she and her mom prayed for 30 years for her brother to come to Christ. Maybe you know someone who needs Jesus. I hope you're encouraged to keep praying. As Evelyn said, don't give up. Or maybe your loved ones do know the Lord and you're just praying for them to love Him more or depend on Him more. If God can save someone who rebelled against Him for years and years, don't you think He can answer your prayers too? If you aren't sure what to pray, either for yourself or your family, there's a book of prayers that you already have. It's called the Bible. (laughs) That's right. It's always a great idea to pray scripture. And we have something that will help you pray the word. It's called Finding the Words to Pray, 50 Scriptures to Guide Your Prayers. This book is a beautiful collection of scripture passages arranged by topic. Along with each passage is space for you to reflect on it and form your own prayer. And this month, we want to send this book to you when you give Revive Our Hearts a gift of any amount. You can do that at reviveourhearts.com or call 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. When you get in touch with us, be sure to ask for your copy of the book, Finding the Words to Pray. Praying for God to change your heart and your family's hearts is crucial, but it doesn't stop there. Next week, we're going to talk about praying for God to move in your church, school, or workplace. I hope you'll be back for that. Thanks for listening today. I'm Dana Gresh. We'll see you next time for Revive Our Hearts Weekend.
Revive Our Hearts Weekend, calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.